I'm going to ask all of our, our guest speakers to turn their cameras back on now. We're going to do uh, a panel discussion, uh, Q&A. So also, if you're an attendee, please be sure to uh, enter in your questions in the chat box, whether you're on joining us via Zoom or Facebook Live. Um, so I'm going to start out with some questions that we got from speakers already, or from attendees already. Uh, have you seen a reduction in reproductive set success of locally impacted species? Interested in the current evidence for residual oil in Louisiana marshes and estuarine sediments and the potential for remobilization. What studies have been completed to show the negative impact on humans? Well, I guess I can take the uh, reproductive success question unless anybody else wants to. Um, the, the best evidence and, and most evidence we have for reduction in reproductive success comes from bottlenose dolphins. The, especially in Barataria Bay, Louisiana, they've been shown to have an 80% uh, reproductive failure rate um, due to the oil. Um, in fish, there have been some suggestions that Pacific herring after the Exxon Valdez was linked to um, lower reproductive success and, and uh, collapse of the, the fishery. In the Gulf, though, um, there's less evidence at this point. Um, I know Nancy Brown uh, Peterson uh, did some things with spotted sea trout in the, uh, at the Gulf Coast Research Lab, uh, but that's um, definitely still some things that we're learning about. Okay. Uh, another question that we had uh, from the audience, what most valuable advice would you give to industry in the Mexican Gulf of Mexico. What are some of the long-term environmental impacts surprises you've encountered? Well, from the standpoint of the uh, of the vegetation, of course, one of the most significant factors has been the erosion of the shoreline. Uh, the marshes that were oiled were primarily uh, bay island marshes. Uh, they were either islands or they were uh, uh, mainland marshes that were, uh, that were adjacent to open water. And they naturally have very high erosion rates. They like one meter per year erosion rates, sometimes somewhat less. Uh, the, but during a hurricane, they can increase to four or five uh, meters per year erosion rate. So we have this natural background erosion rate. And what was obvious was that uh, uh, many of these oil marshes were eroding. And the question was, uh, to what extent did oiling accelerate that erosion? And there were a number of studies that uh, concluded that oil, especially heavy oiling, did have that effect of accelerating erosion. And regardless if the erosion is due to the oil, the accelerated erosion due to the oil or to natural factors such as hurricanes, uh, you have a result of a permanent loss of habitat. And, uh, and that's very significant and is something that, uh, that we saw here uh, resulting from the Deepwater Horizon spill. Um, do you feel that the monetary compensation, that monetary compensation has had significant positive impact on the environment and surrounding communities? Any takers? <laughs> I'll pop in to talk about communities. So uh, there's actually a good deal of evidence, and Missy, I'm glad you brought up the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Um, there's a lot of evidence from the Exxon Valdez oil spill that um, there are a lot of hurt feelings about compensation processes and um, 
it really depends on whether or not you received compensation and how much and whether the people around you received compensation and how much. Um, but there are, there's the potential to create kind of divisions and um, people can have hurt feelings about it. Um, sometimes people feel that it's unfair. There's been research on the Deepwater Horizon oil spill about um, folks feeling that it is, has been an unfair process. Um, to the extent to which it has been helpful um, or uh, what, group, what groups have benefited from it, um, I would not be able to speak to that, but I'm sure, um, I'm sure that there is evidence that that compensation process has been helpful to some. Yeah, and from an environmental standpoint, uh, we do have evidence that in heavily old marshes, the below ground uh, biomass and root production of these, of these plants has been uh, now for several years been affected and is lower than uh, in reference marshes. And if this is universally true, which we don't know, but if it, if it was to be universally true, then uh, that might result in, uh, in greater shoreline erosion because there are fewer roots holding that, that soil together uh, in these heavily oiled uh, marshes. So this is, could be a, a longer term impact. And I was personally very surprised to see that over, I think it was 62 months, maybe it was 70 months, that in uh, Bay Jimmy, our sites still had impact, lower uh, root, live root material in the, mar in the heavily oiled marshes compared to our reference sites. And I would have thought there would have been, you know, recovery by now, but that that apparently has not happened in uh, at least these sites. Okay. Um, a question for Charlie: Have you considered how lab-based exposure to oil could be significantly more extreme than nearshore organisms could encounter in the field? Yeah, and that's a great question, great observation. And I think it really hits the nail on the head of the challenge that we had in uh, determining impacts, you know. Uh, and I think it really gets to the philosophy of science and how we do these sort of impact assessments. Um, you know, you can have an animal in the lab and really control for uh, exposure times, uh, and you can get a, a really good cause and effect relationship from that. But on the flip side, you lose some of the realism uh, um, that you might see in the field. Um, so doing field experiments is always preferable, uh, but for something like uh, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, uh, we, don't, we don't think it's ethical to, to go out and oil a marsh to, to just to look at, um, what impact it might have on uh, Achillefish behavior. Um, so we, uh, we do what we can in the lab and, uh, you know, try to control it, try to use appropriate concentrations, weathering rates, et cetera, and uh, uh, try to use some, um, s some general care in how we perform these experiments to, um, uh, so that we're not ex exposing the fish at uh, an incredibly uh, unrealistic uh, concentration or um, weathering rate. So great, great observation. Okay. Um, for our speakers focused on human dimensions, during your interactions with members of the community, did you experience any reluctance on their part to share their experiences or thoughts? If so, how was that handled and where do you think that reluctance stemmed from? I'll go first. Um, I'm sure both Missy and Vanessa have their own experiences. I guess there's, there's always, always reluctance, um, especially when asking communities that have been asked these questions many, many times over the years. And that's in the business, it's called um, like survey fatigue, for example. You know, and that causes some of that frustration too. It's, you know, you guys keep coming here and asking me these questions and poking around and that adds to that stress. But also there's just, you know, 
um, the stress itself of the event and how the, it continues to be a problem. And it's not just the spill, it's all the other things we deal with in life. Um, and considering the Gulf Coast, like I mentioned in the talk, um, there's other events happening, you know, land loss, floods, climate change. There's just so many challenges, especially in the Gulf. And so all of those things taken together, um, I think that most people want to contribute and want to participate. They want their voices to be heard. But after a while, if they're not being heard, they become more reluctant. And they, if they don't see change happening, they become more reluctant. Um, and so it's important to keep that in mind as we move forward with, you know, creating new projects and programs. Um, we want to make sure that we, the folks doing those projects and programs and the researchers themselves are listening and, and look at these past reports and, and past experiences, past research results. There's a lot out there that can tell us what direction we need to go in. And when we encountered some of those folks, um, you know, some people, you know, they wouldn't come to our workshops or events if they didn't want to. But there were, you know, examples of people that said, hey, I'm not going to come because of this, but here's some information that I want you to consider, you know. So in some ways, we're, we're, we're taken aside and we have personal conversations with people and, you know, we can sometimes convince them to come to our, our workshops and our events. Um, and sometimes we can't. Um, and I think that it's just a very personal choice. And, you know, um, we're never going to strong arm anyone into um, contributing their thoughts and opinions. But again, there's a lot of information out there. And um, I think we need to find new ways to break into some of those communities, especially the ones that Missy was talking about, who are often overlooked um, and for a variety of reasons can't come to the table in the same way that other groups are. I don't know if Missy or Vanessa, you want to add? I just would add to what what Chris just said, yep, I second all of that. Um, it's something that became apparent, not just during these workshops, but through our, other outreach activities you know, that we conduct, is that uh, you can't expect to show up out of the blue, as I said, parachute in to a community that does not know you, doesn't know what your intentions are, maybe has been burned in the past, or has at least been left behind in the past, and think that, um, but look at me, I'm friendly. You should just talk to me. Um, it requires showing up, it requires coming back again, and probably again, and a few more times after that, before you're finally seen as a potential resource. One little shining light that I can say of where it feels like maybe uh, this workshop series at least started to move the ball in terms of uh, community engagement and sharing across the aisle is right after Hurricane Sally came through, I got contacted by members of Sector Mobile, U.S. Coast Guard, and they couldn't remember the full names or had contact information for my community members in Bayou La Battery that had been engaged in the process throughout, and they were trying to make connections with Red Cross um, individuals. And so they came to me and they said, Missy, who was that community member that was involved in Bayou La Battery? We're trying to get them hooked up with the Red Cross. Can you pass on that information? And little things like that require repeated and regular contact. And I considered that like a little success story. So um, people don't sh show up when they don't feel like they're being heard. And every little chance we can do to make them feel heard, I think, builds those relationships. Yeah, I want to build on what both Chris and Missy have said um, about survey fatigue and not parachuting in. So um, this is a, a plug for LSU. I love LSU. Uh, LSU has a particular relationship with uh, folks in Louisiana. Like if you say like, oh, I'm from LSU, people immediately have that connection with you. Um, that's not to say that I don't love University of Mississippi. It's just a school that is received much differently um, in the community. Um, here in Mississippi than, it, than, it, than other schools, for example. Um, so if you're working on large projects or if you are external to the Gulf of Mexico region, consider partnering with folks who do have those connections and do have, those name do have that name recognition um, because it's going to make pe people feel more comfortable. They're going to be more likely to be honest. Um, you know, they, they don't necessarily want to talk about their vulnerabilities to somebody um, who they don't see reflected back in them. 
Great, thank you so much for sharing sharing that. Um, okay, I'm gonna have a question now for, uh, for Charlie. Uh, you mentioned a study where fish exposed to oil lost their avoidance behavior to oil. Has anyone tested if there is a time factor to that loss of avoidance? In other words, do they go back to avoiding oil after a certain amount of time has passed? Or do they retain that loss of avoidance behavior to oil for the rest of their life? Right, so that's a great question. You know, is the damage to sensory mechanisms or olfactory um, organs uh, permanent? Um, this was uh, an interesting uh, study uh, and I'm not a physiologist by training, but there have been studies done that, that show that oil is, uh, can have a narcotic effect. Uh, in Cardona, uh, Mace Barron and others have done uh, these kind of studies showing that uh, there's some nervous system sedation from oil. And uh, there's older studies that show that this kind of wears off after a period of a few days. Uh, this is work that's been done in uh, striped bass and uh, Chinook salmon, so some some freshwater organisms. So how gulf fish respond um, and how long uh, that lasts, uh, interesting future research opportunities. Okay, um, another question uh, which is not directed at anyone in particular, it may be a little bit outside of the scope of, of this webinar, but the question is, even after such widespread de destruction due to the spill, why is there a lack of responsibility from industrial components still now? All right, we might move on to the next question. <laughs> that's okay. Do the crickets. Um, I, I think that that's a, an, an interesting question, but I think it's a little bit outside of the scope of the topics of our guest speakers. Um, Dr. Mendelssohn, any idea why Spartina is so much more resilient than Juncus in an oiled environment? Juncus is usually found higher in the marsh where impacts were less. Spartina is a tough plant, but so is Juncus. Yeah, it's a, a good question. Now, the Juncus that uh, that was affected in these heavily oiled areas were right along the shoreline. And even though this, this, uh, this person is correct, that Juncus is often at higher, at higher elevations. Uh, and we can see that in Louisiana as well. There was Juncus mixed in with Spartina, oh, into easily 10 meters or more into, into the marsh, at least five to 10 meters into the marsh. Now, why one was uh, Juncus was so much more sensitive, uh, it, I don't have an answer for that because uh, these heavily oiled shoreline marshes were smothered by large volumes of Macondo oil. And the above ground tissue, it appeared for both uh, Juncus and Spartina died because all of this this oil completely coated the vegetation. But apparently the underground stems that vegetatively produce new shoots were less affected in, uh, for Spartina than Juncus. So Spartina would have this ability to regrow from these underground shoots. And that partially may be because the underground uh, stems, these underground stems of Spartina, are usually at a somewhat deeper depth in the soil than Juncus, which has these underground shoots closer to the surface. So they could have been more affected by just some superficial oil penetration into the soil. So that's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a lot to say <laughs> with the final answer being, I'm not sure you know, why that is. Uh, the uh, Juncus leaves also seem to absorb a lot of oil. But in this case, maybe more so than Spartina, you can just add oil to the leaf. But, uh, but in this case, they were, they were both smothered equally by the weathered oil. So I don't know if that, that difference would have any, uh, would have any real, real uh, impact. 
So those are some things that maybe future graduate students can investigate. All right. Um, thank you. We're going to have one final question. And I would like to point out to all of our attendees that in the chat box, um, you should be able to see that there is a, an evaluation link. Um, so we'd love to hear your feedback on today's webinar and um, what you liked, what we could do differently. Uh, we'd just like to hear more from you. So if you could uh, be sure to, to take that uh, evaluation survey, it's very short. Um, after today's webinar, that would be really appreciated by our team. Um, so our one final question for our guest speakers, uh, thank you for the emphasis on educating communities. Has any emphasis been given to educating local news media reporters? Um, well, I can't, oh, go ahead, go. Vanessa. What I'll just say quickly is um, I hope that there is emphasis given to educating national news media reporters who say things like the landmass between New Orleans and Mobile. Um, as a Mississippi resident now, that's uh, so it hits a little close to home. Did you want to go ahead, Missy? I was just going to say that that was actually brought up at one of the workshops. Honestly, I can't remember which one. Um, and actually, we had uh, representatives from the news media participate in most of our workshops. Um, obviously, they were there to produce material for their, their outlet. But there, you do find um, uh, particular individuals who are interested in learning and being educated and do report in the way that they, you know, in a journalistic way that they probably should. Um, but obviously, like Vanessa is saying, you know, there's the other kind of group of journalists that maybe don't follow that same sort of ethical reporting. Um, but there, there was um, some interest in doing just that, sort of creating a, a, a training session or a workshop specifically for those folks. Um, and also uh, zeroing in on the important role that they play during uh, an event and after an event. Either they're an important part of getting communication to um, communities that aren't plugged in as much. You know, there's a lot of, you know, people on social media, but if they're reading the wrong information, they're, they're not going to get what they need. So yes, um, that's my, my final answer. There is um, some interest in doing that. Okay. Um, well, thank you all so much for, for staying on the line to, to tackle this, this Q&A session and to give these awesome presentations and, and to share your science about, um, about oil spills and Louisiana. Uh, for all of our attendees, also thank you so much for joining us uh, for this webinar series. Um, uh, I hope that you take the time to do that evaluation, share your feedback, and also I hope to see you on Friday's webinar um, focused on uh, commemorating 10 years of Gomery Science in Texas. And again, you can find information for registering for that, that uh, virtual event on our website, gulfseagrant.org slash oil spill outreach. And uh, until next time, thanks. Bye.